Hey, I'm David Levin, and welcome to another Pop Goes the Culture, the behind-the-scenes and untold TV stories you probably wouldn't have known from the stars and creators. Today, Hal Linden tells us the inside story of the late nights working on Barney Miller and how exhausted they were at the end of a long work week. He remembers shooting episodes which had no endings written until the very last minute at 2 in the morning. He talks about the importance of a writer's words and the highs and lows of her career. Plus, Hal rem reminisces about the Barney Miller rap party. And we also talk about the rumors of Abe Bogota's death and how they started way back when. When we recorded this, Abe was still alive, although he's actually dead now. We'll also talk about Abe's career and how the TV show Fish was created. Plus, what does Hal think Barney Miller is doing today? Here's the great Hal Linden. It's funny because you, you look at the shows and you're supposed to be cops and you're overworked. So I would guess that being up at 2 a.m. shooting would <laughs> give you that burnt out look. It was an amazing experience. Uh, I remember one was the, uh, where we were all st stuck there with the um, uh, quarantine. Mm -hmm. Quarantine, we were all quarantined in and we didn't have the last scene. We didn't have the last scene, the whole last scene. And what he came down with at two o'clock in the morning with pay, fresh pages. The, the camera people had us go sit and play cards while we read it and rehearsed it and staged it at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, was something akin to a, a, a therapy session. I don't know if you remember the episode where everybody got to say how we felt about being stuck with the, the, each other and how they really felt about each other. Uh, I remember, uh, what did Harris call me? I can't remember the phrase, but it was uh, derogatory. <laughs> you know, uh, turkey, something turkey. Uh, compassionate turkey or something like that, you know. <laughs> you know I, f I forget what the phrase was. And, and everybody had these speeches this long about how they felt. And we just staged it and set it and put a camera on it. Okay, do it, do it again, do it again. You like that? You're happy with it? Fine. Now you do yours, you do yours. And in an hour, we knocked the scene off or whatever it was. That's the way we worked. It was because Danny wasn't happy with what was on the page. He didn't want it. He he worked to the last second. To was do. it nerve wracking, or did you come to trust? Eventually, the process? eventually, it became. We trusted it because we knew it was getting better. We knew that when it did come down, it would be the right thing. Again, that scene with with Harris about uh, about the shooting. He was perfectly capable and perfectly comfortable saying to the to his boss, to the creator, "This is wrong." This is wrong. This is not good for me. Why am I apologizing? And such was the respect that went back and forth that everybody listened. That, he, you know, you didn't have a guy saying, read it the way it is, you know, as you would today. Uh, and I suspect that's one of the reasons for its longevity. Somebody said James Brooks used to say, uh if somebody said, do you mind if I change this line? I said, why don't we have a campfire? We can all talk about our... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they weren't nuts either. If you said, this line is, is uh, hard for me because of such and such, how about such and such, you know, if it didn't change the dynamic, mm -hmm. if it didn't alter the, what mm -hmm. was supposed to be happening, it was a great lesson for all of us on, on, on what's important in a scene. I got to tell you, it's been, it was, it was my education and has been my byword ever since. You go and do a show and somebody comes up with a great piece of business, it could get a big laugh. But if it's not heading in the same direction that the scene is heading, it's disruptive. You and you learn that. It takes time to learn that, and I'm telling you, a good deal of my education came from that show, from learning it from Danny, as to what fits, what's right. And he was not against business or funny. He just wanted to <coughs> make sure that, that, that it propelled the, 
the story forward. And that's always been my byword ever since. You had a spectacular career. Danny. Danny Rivers. A spectacular, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot, a lot of downs, by the way. Yeah, well, who doesn't? <laughs> Danny once told me about how he, when he was, he used to buy the nickels and pennies from the uh, parking meters. He went to the city of, I think it was in Palm Springs at the time, and bought, gave them dollars for those pennies. And he would sit looking through the pennies because he knew which were valuable ones. Danny was a coin collector. And he knew which ones had value. And he could find enough that were worth 75 cents instead of a nickel. Or, and that's how got through. tight it was for Danny. So, I mean, it's all of us have been there. You know, it grounds you, too. You couldn't blow smoke at Danny anymore you can blow it at me anymore you know <laughs> we've all been there we know what's you know you told me a great story about the um the, the rap party about uh rona barrett and the Andrew i don't remember if it was rona barrett i remember who it was oh, but okay. it was one of the one of those uh gossip ladies you know at, that uh our at, at our rap party she was in attendance and uh Abe wasn't. Abe wasn't there anymore. He had not. Uh, he didn't get. I don't think he got back for the final show. I don't recall. He, I think he was. Uh, Did he theater, show theater in Canada? He was doing theater in Canada, uh, because he, again he was not on the show anymore. And this gossip, I think it may have been Rona Barrett, said uh, in her column, you know what a wonderful party was. Everybody was there except the late Abe Vigoda. And that poor man has been denying his death ever since. Everybody thinks he's dead. Abe Vigoda works more than I do. He's, he's still kicking. He's still quite functioning. I'm quite a gentleman. Abe is, a, Abe is something else. <laughs> Abe is something else. Um, let's see this. You know, Abe was not hired, was not sent up. You talk about, you know, careers. How about Abe's career? Abe hadn't done anything. Abe and I actually once did a, a commercial together in the 60s. I think we pushed a car <laughs> together. You know, it was, a, it was a, a gig, a commercial gig. And many years later, again, he, he got uh, The Godfather and he was so successful and he was so memorable in The Godfather that he was sent up by his agent to meet with Danny Arnold about a character, I don't remember the name of the character, an Italian character, it was actually the precursor in the original pilot to Jack Sue. He sat at that desk. And Danny took one look at him, and heard his voice and looked at his eyes and said, read this. And he created fish right out of... So he has, yeah, I'm sure he has his stories too. Did your show change when he left to do Fish? It evolved all the time. It evolved all the time for a couple of reasons. One, Danny stopped writing all the scripts. <laughs> uh, we had, uh, you know, some terrific people who took over and, and were creating the scripts. And, and the character, again, the characters evolved. Uh, I don't know where, uh, where the idea for, came from for uh, Harris to write a book. You know, that can all of a sudden be the great author or, uh, you know, some of the other changes that happened in the characters. But they evolved out of the characters and out of the actors. And there was the writers who were sensitive to these qualities in, the, in, in us that wrote them into the script. Right. So it, it changed and evolved. If we had found more writers, we'd still be going. <laughs> <laughs> we would have been old, but we would still be going. What do you think Barney Miller is doing today, that character? Well, you know, Danny had a always wanted to do a uh, a feature film on it. Um, he had he had a script written, I think, about a kind of a uh, Danny has now made uh, uh, Barney has made Inspector finally, and has to take over a a, a, a precinct house that's in trouble that's it's not working. And 
for help calls back some of his old guys. And, and it was kind of a, a, you know, I guess a reunion show. It was never made, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would imagine that's what happened. He probably finally made inspector and went on to, uh, to do that. Probably by now he's the police chief of uh, some town in Florida, you know. <laughs> Maybury. Yeah, <laughs> Maybury. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Well, Barney. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's all we've got time for for now. Next time in part six, the final part of my interview with the great Hal Linden, TV's Barney Miller. Hal tells us what he thinks the real reason is that the Barney Miller cast never won an Emmy. We talked about his good experiences in theater and then came back around to what was then his current gig when we were doing this interview, Pirates of Penzance on Broadway, how much he loves the work and how he feels about keeping memorabilia. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching.